Hi, we're going to talk about collocative properties and these are crazy interesting. Collocative actually means depends on the amount. Let me say that again, it depends on the amount. So with that in your mind, let's go ahead and look at the definition. So collocative properties are physical properties that are affected by the number of particles. But here's the catch that makes it so interesting. But it does not matter the identity of the solute particle. So let me give you an example. We're going to take pure water and we're going to put some sodium chloride into that water and then we're going to dissolve some potassium chloride. Now you know ionic compounds, these are going to dissociate. Um, this is going to dissociate into a sodium ion plus a chloride ion and they will um, go through the salvation process, be surrounded by water. The potassium chloride, same thing, the potassium chloride and the, or excuse me, the potassium and the chloride ions. So a collocative property, here's the impact. Um, it is simply the number of ions, and it doesn't matter what ions those are. Each ion counts as a particle. So this would be considered two particles, one sodium plus one chloride, and then this would be considered two particles, one potassium plus one chloride. And guess what? It doesn't matter that those aren't the same ions. All that matters is that you have two that two particles are going to be released into either of those solutions. So it depends on the amount. Um, now, particles in counting these. Um, Non-electrolytes, so anything that's not going to conduct electricity. And uh, a good visual for, the, um, for this is going to be um, like covalent compounds that don't dissociate, they don't ionize um, in water. They would be considered one. So sugar, glucose, for example, if I had a C6H12O6, um, that would be considered one particle because it's not going to break into carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. So that's one particle. Um, it will stay together. Now ionic compounds, um, the big thing is that you count the number of ions that dissociate. Um, I'll tell you right now from data, when I worked at the University of Utah, thank you to Dr. Butch Atwood, um, if students can dissociate mo uh, compounds, um, they have a 99% chance of getting an A in 1210 and 1220. That's that first year general chemistry. So this is a big deal. And at the U, there was a cutoff. The um, top 10% got an A. Didn't matter what the bell cover looked like, 10% got an A. Um, so if you can dissociate ionic compounds, you're doing really, really well. Let me show you another one. Let's take a calcium uh, phosphate. We're gonna do a calcium phosphate. So I've got Ca3PO42. We're going to put this in water and I want to know how many particles, how many particles are going to break apart, dissociate into this solution. Um, so you break it into the cation and the anion. The cation is the calcium and I ask myself, well, how many calciums will there be? There will be three calcium ions. And then the anion is going to be that phosphate, the PO4 minus three. You could look that up on a polyatomic table or our trick, you just cross charges back up and see that calcium's a plus two and that the phosphate's a minus three. Now I've got how many phosphates? Two. Dose, as we say in America sometimes. Now all I have to do is count. We've got one, two, three, four, five total ions. So this would be five ions. Um, now, little uh, spoiler alert on this. The more particles that you have, the greater the impact on that physical property. So let's go ahead and look at the physical properties. There are four physical properties that are going to be impacted. The first one is boiling point elevation. Then we've got freezing point depression, vapor pressure lowering, and osmotic pressure. In a nutshell, what happens is when you take a pure solvent, dissolve anything in it, okay? Put any solute into it, it's going to stretch the range that that particular solvent, the now solution, will stay in the liquid phase. Let me show you this. So we're going to use water as our, as our example. We know that water boils at um, 100 degrees C, degrees C. So I'm going to do a line right here, and then you know that water freezes at zero degrees C. Okay, so that's pure water. This is going to be H2O. Now, let's make a solution. We will use bright pink just because I like bright pink. Um, now we're going to have a solution of water plus 
table salt, okay? We're going to add two particles, okay? Um, that salt's going to dissociate, and in essence, we say that releases two particles. Um, and I know that we're going to have trillions and trillions, so we just look at how many particles one will release. Here's what happens. The boiling point increases and the freezing point decreases. So it might boil, depending on how much table salt we put into it, it might boil at 104 degrees. And it might freeze now at like a minus six degrees C. So notice the range, instead of being a range of 100, the range is now 110. Um, so by adding the solute to the solvent, we stretch the range so that it stays in the liquid phase. And that's how you can remember, boiling point goes up, freezing point goes down. Now, vapor pressure and boiling point, you know, are related. Vapor pressure, that's going to be um, those molecules changing phases from um, the liquid to the gas. If you add any solute to the solvent, it's going to take more energy to evaporate and change phases. And remember, boiling point is just the very, very special point at which vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. So if you have a higher boiling point, it means that lowers the vapor pressure. It's going to take more energy to evaporate, 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 and finally reach atmospheric pressure. That's why that boiling point and vapor pressure, why they're related. Uh, now, osmotic pressure. Um, maybe you learned this in a biology class. Osmotic pressure is when you have a semi-permeable membrane and you're going to have um, ions on each side. Um, Water is usually what will move through. It's the solvent that moves through the semi-permeable membrane. It will move through um, that membrane in order to um, maintain, or to what? Equalize, bring into equilibrium the concentrations of, um, of the two solutions. So for example, if here's my hand. Let's say that I go in the ocean and I'm swimming and I love the ocean. I get out, my fingers are all pruney. Well, the concentration in the ocean is really, really high. My um, skin is going to act as that semi-permeable membrane. And on the other side, um, I'm, we're thinking there's less, okay, concentration. My body's like, oh, we've got to bring the ocean and what's inside of me into equilibrium. So my skin says, dilute the ocean. And the water goes through that semi-permeable membrane. Um, so concentration, amount of solute versus solution, that's osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure definitely depends on the amount of solute. And does it matter what the solute is? No, uh, but that pressure, it does depend on the amount of, of um, solute. Okay, let's see here. Now, there are two formulas associated with this. It's going to be the boiling point and the freezing point. I have a video for each of those. Um, there's a table that you use. I'll explain and um, do an example for you. Uh, this is just a great big overview that colligative properties depend on the amount. Doesn't matter what the solute is, what matters is how many particles does that break into. Okay, have a good day. Thanks so much.